You are watching Time Out with Sylvia Crowley. It has been my goal for this blog talk radio show to eventually go to television. Well, tonight is the first time that I will do a face-to-face -face interview with my guest, Charlotte Smith. Welcome, Charlotte, to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No problem. Time Out is a show that focuses primarily on sports. And when you think about a Time Out, it's that period of time where you pause, you assess the situation, you correct some things, you regroup and resume with the opportunity to perform better. During my show, I interview people from all career paths, but I highlight those Time Out moments that have caused them to pause, assess, correct, regroup, and resume. And so tonight we are going to talk to Charlotte Smith about her timeout moments. Charlotte, speaking of a timeout, we're just going to jump right into this. Um, Charlotte and I are former teammates and when we played for the University of North Carolina, Coach Hatchell called a timeout in a national championship game. We were down by three with seven tenths of a second left on the clock. Charlotte, what were you thinking when your name was called in the huddle to shoot the game-winning shot? Well, there were a gamut of emotions that I was experiencing, and I was thinking about a lot of things um, that had previously transpired before that timeout moment. I remember the de defensive possession where Pam Thomas, she comes down, and I think we were in zone at that time, and she hits the baseline jumper to put them ahead by two points. And at that point, I, I was thinking that, it's over, it's over, and how can we ever win this game? You, I mean, when Marion Jones tied up the ball with .7 seconds left on the clock, I vividly remember looking up to the clock and seeing .7 seconds and thinking, like, what can you do in that amount of time? So during that timeout, all I could ever think of was that it's over, we're done, and I'm thinking about all the hard work that we invested, and, and there's no way we have another opportunity. <laughs> Here's the shot, Charlotte Smith. Yes. Funny story is uh, when we walked into the, onto the court after our coach, you know, she drew up the play and told us, you know, who was going where. When we stepped out on the court and we did our own team huddle, Charlotte looked at me and said, what are we running? I said, Charlotte, we're running 30s for you. You're going to take the shot, you know? And so I could tell that you were thinking about things that happened yeah. prior to that because um, your name was called right. and you didn't even know. Right. Um, tell me this. We ran 30s and um, we set a screen. You were, we, Tanya Sampson was a decoy and I screened my man because they switched. Stephanie Lawrence threw the pass out to you. At this time, you have probably only hit I, I would I would think it's safe to say about eight three point eight, shots. Eight three point shots at that <laughs> so time. you weren't really considered a three point shooter. Very right. gutsy move on our coach's part to go for the win and not the tie. We could have just shot a two pointer and tied it up. Tell tell our listeners what was going through your mind when that shot left your hands. Yeah. Well, back to what you were saying in regards to me forgetting the play. Well, well, during the timeout, you know, when I knew that we had to go for three instead of two, I was thinking like, okay, so who is Coach Hatcher going to pick? Because I knew I wasn't the best three-point shooter on the team. So when she called my name, I was thinking, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, the game is in my hands and what if I miss it? And then, you know, that moment where, you know, we're running 30s, I set the screen for Tanya Sampson and she goes to the ball Everybody goes with Tanya Sampson because she was considered our go-to player at the time. And so when I'm backpedaling out behind the three, as the ball is coming, it seems like an eternity. The ball hits my hands, and all I can think is I'm just praying the whole time, please, God, let this <laughs> shot go in. Yeah, I remember I was praying that it would go in. And as the ball was going through the air, it seemed like it took forever it to get to the rim. And it was complete silence. I couldn't hear anything. Mm -hmm. And then when the ball went through the net, I was actually under the basket and it fell in my hands. And that's when it hit me. She, she hit the shot. <laughs> we won the game. And then I could hear all, all the people screaming and everything. And we jumped on top of you and pow. You know, there was a big pow. And we all piled on top of you. Charlotte Smith, the six-footer from Shelby, North Carolina, 
that was brilliant yesterday, was sensational in the second half here today, set a record for rebounds, and makes the shot of her young life. How did that shot change your life? Tremendously. I mean, it puts you on a national stage, an international stage even. I mean, people all around the world heard about the shot. And I, even to this day, I still have people that come up to me and, and they're telling the stories about where, you know, I could probably write a book about where they were and how they responded. I've heard so many different stories about people. You know, I was in my living room and I had my baby in my arms and I jumped up and I, and I dropped Threw the, the baby. baby. <laughs> So it's it, it's always incredible to hear all of the stories, but I mean it, I mean you're on magazines, you're in papers, you're on television. I mean it just puts you on a national stage, and I mean that's it's like your name goes down in history, and that's something that can never be taken away from you, and not just myself, but all of my teammates as well. You right. know we've all made our our mark. I, I was able to see your career kind of take off after that. Um, you know, you were a junior when you made that shot. Your senior year, you became more of a three-point threat from the three-point line. Um, you became the second woman in women's basketball history to dunk in a game and, um, you know, was an All-American and Player of the Year. And, and, and your teammates were a able to do some incredible things as well. You know, we had opportunities to play professional basketball. So just a great moment in your career and, and in all of our careers in a time that I don't think we'll ever forget. Um, speaking of the championship game, I know that your father actually missed that moment, the biggest shot of your life, um, along with my mother, because they were on their, their knees and they were praying they that were. we would win that game. Um, when I talk about your father, he was a pastor of a church. Mm -hmm. um, your mom, epitome of a first lady, very humble, very quiet, um, and they have now passed away. What legacy did they leave you? I think the greatest legacy that my parents left was a legacy of love. You know, when I think back on their lives, they were just so full of love. My mom and dad, they would take people in off the streets and, and feed them and clothe them and 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 preach to them, preach to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the greatest legacy that they left was a legacy of love. They loved people. Like my parents, they would go out into the neighborhoods. They would go to the elderly homes to play the piano, to read the Bible to them. They just loved people. And I think the greatest legacy that you can leave is love because love never dies. Hmm. Um, what would you say is your greatest timeout moment? Because you, we, you've had a lot of success. You know, we've talked about you went in a national championship, you played professional basketball, um, you're now a coach at Elon, and people see your resume, and it looks very impressive. You know, you, you've done a lot of things, especially young in life, but a lot of people don't know the dash in between. You know, it's the time you were born through present, but that dash, there's a lot of things that happen to shape you into who you are. And I think it's important for people to hear those things that have helped shape and mold you into the person you are today. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you consider your greatest timeout moment that have caused you to pause, assess the situation, correct some things, and, and regroup and resume? Right. Well, in the world of sports, I think my greatest timeout moment was just in my professional career. You know, having gone from UNC, having won a national championship, and accumulated all of these accolades, after a while, you can start, you start to identify more with the accolades than who you are as a person. And I just remember vivid, vividly in the WNBA, you know, year after year, writing a list of things that I wanted to accomplish. You know, I want to make the all-star team. Uh, I want to be MVP, you know, all those things that I had accomplished before. And after each season, you know, I would look at that list and, you know, I didn't achieve this, I didn't accomplish this. And it was almost like I was on a performance treadmill. And each season I would end in disappointment because mm. I didn't accomplish those things. And it was almost like basketball had become my God. And I just remember it was like each year I would present this almost like a wish list to God. Like these are the things that I want to accomplish. And I just remember so vividly when I was praying him saying, well, what have you done for me lately? And I thought about that and I thought about like sports, how it's such a great platform 
to do so many great things and to touch so many lives. And I was so consumed about my own personal agenda, the things that I wanted to accomplish that I had lost sight of, you know, why we really play the game. And that's to glorify Him. And so I thought about it, you know, I sat back, I made an assessment, thought about, you know, what are some things that I can do to help glorify God through sports because it's such a great platform. So I actually started um, a company called Three Point Play, which is a company that designed t-shirts. And I remember the first t-shirt that I designed was from the name of my Charlotte Sting team, which is Sting, still trusting in a never failing God, and was just starting to branch out and really try to use ba basketball as a platform to start my ministry. Hmm. And so what, what was the lesson you learned from that timeout moment? How has that, how have you incorporated that into your life now? All right, well, it's just teaching young people that basketball is what you do and not who you are. Mm. I think a lot of times we can go through identi identity crisis feeling like, you know, basketball is who we are and basketball can become our God. So I think it's important to speak to young people about how to keep it in perspective and understand why you play the sport. It's a platform for so many other things, but don't let it become your God. Don't let it become your identity because you are so much more than basketball. Who are you? I am a God-fearing woman who loves the Lord, who loves sports, and I love the opportunity that sports presents to impart into the lives of young women and young men. Hmm. Interesting. Um, what would you say is your second greatest timeout? I know you have many timeouts, as, <laughs> as we all do, but if you could pick another timeout moment, what would that be? I think another time out moment was in the passing of both my parents. Um, I lost my mom uh, in 1996. That was at the start of the American Basketball League. It was a, a very pivotal moment in my life. I remember, you know, being so excited about the ABL and talking to my mom about the draft because, you know, the draft was coming up and they had already pre-assigned players. Uh, from the Olympic team, yourself, you were already pre-assigned, and I was telling my mom, you know, I want to be in Colorado with Sylvia, and I want to be the first one drafted to play. And she was like, you know, well, if you believe it, it can happen for you. And I just remember the phone ringing, and I was the first one to be drafted, was headed out to Colorado. My mom was super excited. I never forget when she showed up at the townhouse. She was so excited because she was, it was a new townhouse, and she was like, oh, I love new stuff. <laughs> and um, later on that evening, she started um, suffering from complications, and we thought it was heartburn. And eventually, they found out that it was double pneumonia, and she passed away. And it was, it was a very hard moment for myself because my mom had never been sick, um, and I had continued at that point to, to go to practice. I didn't visit the hospital as much because I was consumed with basketball. And that was a moment where it just made me think about, you know, the value of life and how life is such a vapor and how we have to value those around us. Never forget to say I love you. Uh, and, you know, 10 years later, I found myself, you know, in the same situation with my father, having lost him. And uh, I, I just remember being on the road when I played in the WNBA. I was in Detroit. We were in shoot around. And I just felt like at that moment, you know, I've already lost my mom. I value family. I understand the importance of being there. So I immediately got on a plane and I spent the last week with my father. You know, so just lessons and takeaways from that is, is that we have to understand that life is but a vapor. We have to cherish and love those around us. And it was a critical point for me because I, you know, and it challenged my faith. When I lost my mom, I was angry with God and I was bitter with God and I turned away from the very thing that had always been my rock and my foundation. And I stopped reading my Bible for a while. I stopped praying for a while, only to come to the realization that, you know, God is, he is my hope. He is the one that I trust in and he's the one, he is my rock. Mm -hmm. um, I want to transition right here. Um, you, okay, so you're playing professional basketball and you started to transition into coaching. Um, you became the third assistant at the University of North Carolina mm -hmm. and um, later had an opportunity after sitting under Coach Hatchell for many years, um, I think eight or nine years, nine years, nine years mm -hmm. um, you became the head coach of Elon University. Um, why do you coach? I coach just to make a difference in the lives of those who God surrounds me with. and. The incredible thing about coming here to Elam was the night before my press conference, I had the opportunity to meet with the team. Mm -hmm. And I just presented to them, what's important to you? 
because I think it's very important for us as coaches to understand what's important to the players. And I was so excited because they said, my family and my faith. You know, you would expect for them to say win championships because as a coach, you know, you want to win championships mm -hmm. and you want to win games. But I was so impressed with the fact that they were so grounded and they understood and valued the things that are most important in life. Mm -hmm. What is it that you want to impart to your players before they graduate from Elon? Mm -hmm. You know, when I think about it, I always think about Coach Hatchell, our coach at North Carolina, and she used to always say that you, you live your life in a fishbowl and people are always watching. You know, it's like no matter what you accomplish on the court, no matter how smart you are academically, your character is what keeps you. And so I'm always every day trying to emphasize the importance of who you are as a person when no one is watching. And then another thing she talked about is life is not a dress rehearsal. You're always on stage, you know, you're always on stage, you're always performing, but you're performing for an audience of one. I think if we can get it in our minds that, you know, our ultimate goal is to please our father. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that makes all the difference in the world. And then also, you know, here at college, in college, it's a small window of time. It's four years of your life, maybe five years of your life. And someone is investing in you, making a great investment in you. And I think the greatest way that you can say thank you is by operating in a spirit of excellence. And that's the one thing that I really try to promote with the team and inspire the girls. You know, as a leader, you have to emulate the behavior that you desire. Mm. And so I always try to walk in a spirit of excellence and do things the right way so that they can see that and carry that on in life. Yeah. Makes sense because when you were a captain at North Carolina, you were the type of leader that led by example. So mm -hmm. um, it is no surprise to me that you would lead your team by example. <clears throat> and I was going to say one of the other things as well is, is you know, as leaders, you want to lead by example, but also as leaders, you, you make mistakes. And I think transparency to me is very important. And that's one of the things that I've done with my players is try to be very transparent about some of the mistakes that I've made so that they can avoid those pitfalls as well. Mm -hmm. And just talk about a lot of things that I struggle with and some of the things that I went through as a collegiate athlete. I think if you can empathize with someone rather than sympathize, then it makes you that much more closer to that person. Mm -hmm. I think um, when it comes to leadership that I should be able to look at what you're leading and that looks like you. And so I've, I've had a chance to interact with you and your players this week at camp. And um, as I saw the camp operate with your staff and with your players, I got a chance to see what you lead. And it looked like you, which is an incredible compliment given that you've only, this is what, your third year third. at Elon? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times you inherit players that aren't players that you really recruited, you know, so they, they've come from a different coach and they, they have that personality, but in just three years' time, this program looks like you, you mm -hmm. know, and I think, um, I think that's good for any type of leadership, whether you're a teacher, whether you're, you know, a parent, whether you're um, in any type of profession, um, it should look like the leader, and if it doesn't, then you're leading a lie, and I think you have to go back and correct um, who you are as a leader to, to change some things. Um, when you, when a lot of coaches get hired and they have their press conference, mm -hmm. they say that, you know, they, they have their goals and their vision for the team. And then once they get the job and they kind of settle into that job and they figure out what can and can't be done in terms of their university and the location of their university and maybe the even the budget of their university um, sometimes those goals change you know you just you have a more realistic view of what can and cannot be done how have your goals changed since the day you were named head coach at Elon um, I think the goals that have changed the most are probably in terms of, you know, accomplishments on the court. And I've shifted from, you know, of course you want them to desire to be champions, you know, but I think if you emphasize that so much at the end of the year, they're disillusioned and disappointed when they don't accomplish that. So I think the biggest thing in terms of success, I think the strategy has been to uh, emphasize excellence because everybody can operate in a spirit of excellence, and then the results will take care of, care of themselves. Mm -hmm. 
That's, that's very interesting. Um, you were able to write a book and you know, as you are coaching your players and emphasizing the spirit of excellence, you were also thinking of all coaches mm -hmm. and their ministry as leaders. Um, um, and the name of your book is When Coaches Pray. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you this question. What happens when coaches pray? When coaches pray? Well, I wrote the book because I looked at the climate of coaching in collegiate sports or in on any level, you know, I felt like we've kind of gotten away from um, what coaching is all about. And the first thing is, is just building up the young ones for God's glory, but also just um, teaching them how to be successful in life. And that entails, you know, doing things the right way, um, talking about things that you struggle with. In the book, I talk a lot about um, just just my fears and things that you know I went through in my first year as a coach and it's been very gratifying to hear from a lot of the coaches I'm so glad that you wrote this book because these are some of the things that I was struggling with these are some of the things I wish I would have known before I got the job but I think you know the biggest thing about coaches praying is, is that it puts you in fellowship and communion with your creator he created you he positioned you for this purpose. And I think you have to seek him for wisdom and guidance. I think that's the biggest thing that prayer does is it gives you wisdom and it gives you guidance. When I thought about taking this job as a coach, I was reading about Solomon because in, everybody's a coach in some capacity, whether you're a coach of a church, whether you're a coach of a household as a mother, we all coach in some capacity and we all need guidance we all need wisdom there's no blueprint for how to be a mom there's no perfect blueprint there's no perfect book for that there's no perfect blueprint for a coach but i think when we can get in the heart of worship and prayer before god he can give us the wisdom in how to how to lead those who he's called us to steward mm -hmm. and i thought about solomon you know when god asked solomon what is it that i can do for you he didn't ask for riches he didn't ask for wealth he asked for wisdom, mm -hmm. and I think as a leader, prayer puts you in a position of humility, saying, I don't know it all, and I need your guidance and mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't have wisdom, we can ask for it. And you can ask for That's it. In the word. Um, there's a question I want to ask you, because on the cover of the book, I wish we had one right now, but on the cover of the book, it has a picture of two men's hands together mm -hmm. praying. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting because I didn't recognize those hands. Uh -huh. And so I thought, why wouldn't she use her hands <laughs> well, in the picture? What is it? Big old men's hands in the picture. Why, why did you choose say, to well, do that? I was well, if you've seen my hands after years of basketball, you'd understand why I didn't put mine on the cover. No, but that was um, marketing, marketing. Um, you know, I'm a female. I'm Charlotte Smith. And, you know, most people know that Charlotte, you know, is a female name. Um, we put the men's hands on the front of the book so that it would cross over, so that men won't feel like, you know, this book is not for me and it doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. um, we want to try to reach the masses in terms of, you know, this book being in the hands of men, being in the hands of women, being in the hands of coaches, being in the hands of non-coaches, because at the end of the day, the book is God's word. Mm -hmm. His word applies to all. And so that was more of a marketing strategy in order to reach the masses. Brilliant strategy, actually, <laughs> because you. I think men are very visual, you know, mm -hmm. and so when they see that cover and they see the men's hands, they can identify with it. So that was actually a pretty smart move right there. Um, the proceeds to the book actually doesn't go to you. Who? Where does the proceeds to the book go to? Well, my first fruit offering was to order a lot of books and then have them at the final four because I felt like that's where we could really get the book in the hands of a lot of coaches. Mm -hmm. And so for that first round of the books that we printed out, all of the proceeds went to benefit FCA, which is Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Mm -hmm. And that was an organization that I was involved with um, in high school. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it's such an incredible organization in terms of reaching student athletes and keeping them grounded. And so I wanted to be able to contribute back to an organization that has been so impactful in my life. Wow. That says a lot about you that you would write a book and, you know, that's not for yourself or for your monetary gain, but you would donate that to an organization um, such as FCA. 
Can you tell our um, listeners and our viewers where they can find your book? Mm -hmm. Well, When Coaches Pray is available on Amazon.com. It's also available on BarnesandNobles.com and also at SportsSpectrum.com. And you can get an autographed copy from Sports Spectrum. I actually have my copy and I read it daily and it prepares me, even though I'm no longer in coaching, it prepares me for my day, you know, and how mm -hmm. to handle things during that day. And, um, and like you said, everyone is a coach to some capacity, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'm now an army wife, so I'm the coach of my, my household <laughs> as I'm cleaning and cooking. But um, you, you talked earlier about your parents leaving you a legacy, mm -hmm. and you see now how valuable that is. What legacy do you want to leave? The very same one. I always say I want to leave a legacy of love. Love you know that the Bible talks about faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And love never dies, love never fades. If, if you share love, you share hope. And you can share love in so many different capacities. Um, you know, I tell my players, I tell them that I love them. You know, I'm not ashamed to tell them that because I genuinely do love my players. Um, I love people. I want to be able to make a difference in the lives of others. So my legacy is just a legacy of love. Um, as I listen to you talk about the legacy your parents left and you said that it was love, um, it made sense just when we were growing up, we always felt like on our team that you would give the shirt off your back to people. You know, if it was your last bite, you would give it to people. And, um, and I always said, you know, she has such a servant's heart, you know, but I realize now what it was, you mm -hmm. know, it was just that love that your parents passed to you and now yeah. you're passing that to others. And so, so your, your parents actually live on through you mm -hmm. and now you're passing that to your players and now, you know, they'll spread that and it just continues. Um, I, I just want to thank you for being transparent today and sharing some of your most intimate timeout moments with mm -hmm. us. I think that you can learn from anyone. And so hearing the lessons that you've learned from your timeout moments, hopefully that our listeners and our viewers will be inspired and, and kind of learn from your situation as well. And, um, you know, I just want to leave with the notion of love being the greatest thing. And, and even being a servant, Jesus was um, one of the greatest leaders ever. Um, and he did that by serving and by loving others. And so um, I just want to applaud um, Coach Smith for being, you know, such an excellent leader and leading by example with her team. And she's doing that by having a servant's heart and by loving. Thank and you. So, um, so you are watching Time Out and you're listening to Time Out with Sylvia Crawley featuring Charlotte Smith. Um, I want to encourage you to tune in every Monday at 7 o'clock. And um, that's my time for today. God bless.